Thank you very much, Hanya. Thank you to the NNI for inviting me, and thank you, David, for putting into context uh, all the difficult stuff prior to my presentation, which will be um, much simpler, and we'll try to ask a question in relation to some of the points that David introduced, which were, how can we understand the, the real-life functions of these HMOs across the world? in the different populations, different feeding modes, and try to ask the first questions. And I, I emphasize that first questions because it seems to me, and incidentally, I'm absolutely no expert in this, this field at all. Uh, the reason I'm giving this presentation is that we work in a setting where collaborators have come, including David himself, and um, uh, contributed to asking some of those questions. So he will have to answer all the difficult questions in the question time. But what is important, and, and what it seems to me, is that we are in the very earliest stages, or we're in the foothills of the mountains yet to climb in terms of all this wonderful biology that was presented in the plenary session by Professor Stahl and then uh, by David just now. Uh, we've got a long way to go, and in a way, that will be the theme uh, of my presentation. My disclosures are as follows. NNI has supported this presentation, and uh, I'm a member of the advisory board, and I teach on their wonderful pediatric nutrition course each year, which is led by Hanya. Um, I advise Nestle and Danone occasionally on their research portfolios. I'm a board for Danone Institutes, a board member for Danone Institutes International, and I'm a member of the PAC for Harvest Plus. So, a Gambian baby is brought into the world in relatively good shape. I say relatively because they're smaller than we would hope that they would be. And uh, that growth, as I shall show you shortly, uh, continues to be poor. But they're born in a relatively, and again I stress the word, relatively aseptic state. But they're born into a highly infectious and dangerous environment. Uh, many others have talked about the development of the immune system in the early neonates, and you've heard a little bit about how HMOs play a role in, and, and how the gut microbiota play a role in helping to teach that baby the difference between friend and foe in terms of organisms and antigens. So we start off life in relatively good shape. But here's data from 54 countries around the world, a meta-analysis, and what happens is something quite shocking. So the babies in general, these are from low and middle income countries. In general, uh, babies are born a bit small. Then if you look at the blue line for height, you'll see that initially there's, there's good news. When fully breastfed in most of these cases, the babies start to catch up a bit compared to the WHO uh, 50th centile, which is the horizontal line there. But then the trouble starts, and you see this precipitate drop-off in height for age over the first two years of life. Now, the combination of what happens in those two years with the 270 days of pregnancy adds together to be the first 1,000 days, and that's why we hear the use of the first 1,000 days as an advocacy tool. Incidentally, I always like to take the opportunity to remind people that although the first 1,000 days is super critical, it's not the only thing that is critical. And there is uh, a lot of important uh, development goes on even before the baby is conceived. Now let's take a look at that in the Gambia, and we see really a very similar situation. So babies are born a little bit small, but then from three months onwards, look at this horrendous growth loss. They're dropping two and a half centiles in the first year of life compared to what they should be doing uh, in the WHO um, well-nourished breastfed cohorts. So what's going on? Well, it's this uh, incredibly infectious environment. The kids are protected from that for the first three months, not only by the active processes of breastfeeding, but also by, if you like, the passive processes of being kept on the mother's back and uh, simply fed breast milk. The infections and the poor environment are the drivers. What are the mediators? Well, we think that it is what we call environmental enteric dysfunction, EED. And that is described in this schema here. On the left-hand side, we have a healthy um, gut 
wall with nice long villi and a, a, a lack of inflammation. On the right-hand side, we see what we see if we do, um, uh, if we take biopsies and look histologically. We see that there are these terribly blunted villi. The absorptive area of the gut is reduced, and we have a massive infiltration of active inflammatory cells. So this does a combination of things. First, it reduces the absorptive surface area for nutrients. Second, it is using up an awful lot of energy and nutrients in mediating this constant aggressive pathology in the gut. So what is the role? That is happening in our population in spite of the fact that these mums, one of whom is shown here, are probably amongst the best breastfeeders in the entire world. We never see an artificial feeding bottle in our villages. They feed naturally and openly, as you can see from this picture. There's 100% breastfeeding, and they continue feeding to two years of life. There may be issues around them uh, introducing uh, weaning foods rather too early, and of course we're working on that in what we call our baby-friendly village initiatives to try to promulgate the exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months. But in spite of being fantastic breastfeeders, unfortunately, their kids still do as badly as I've just illustrated. Now, of course, it's not just about breastfeeding. It's also about linking and transitioning from being fully breastfed to uh, the weaning, the introduction of complementary foods. And that's a process which certainly does not occur optimally within our environment and which we uh, are constantly trying to help with. So we tried to ask this question, which is a little similar to the triangle that um, David showed. And I think, the again, I'm going to stress, and I'll do that yet again at the end, that although we can articulate in our minds these are the questions we want to ask, the amount of data that is really solidly available to do this is, is still in rudimentary state, despite the wonderful um, uh, start towards that end that David uh, showed earlier. So, we would assume that there could well be, probably is, a relationship between human milk oligosaccharides and infant health. Otherwise, why would they all be there in these enormous amounts and this enormous diversity that David described to you? That could be mediated through the milk microbiome. It's been a surprise to a lot of us in the last decade or so that breast milk has a microbiome, and I'll show you a little data on that. That, in turn, could affect the gut microbiome, and that would be an interaction between the prebiotics of the HMOs and the organisms that are coming across in the breast milk. And, by either, and, and of course, those two can influence each other. And by any of these mechanisms, and almost certainly a combination of these mechanisms, there can be linkage between the HMOs and the baby's health. So I'm going to show you data from two studies which, again, I stress, have been conducted by collaborators but using um, materials and uh, human samples taken from our field site. We know that HMO levels decline as lactation pro progresses. They decline quite sharply uh, in the first three months of life. In a small sample, and I'll just make another point here that... Um, Although David just showed us studies that are getting up to sort of 250 babies and so, which is brilliant, the techniques have been somewhat cumbersome in the past, getting very much better very rapidly. So there is a tendency for a lot of the publications to have rather small samples, and that's something we must hold our hands up to. Uh, the work we have done so far is based on small sample sizes, and that's an agenda point for the future to very much increase those. Uh, what we found was that the growth at or the growth achieved by 20 weeks of age was significantly related to a number of the HMOs. And you'll see that for the uh, three prime SL, there's quite a strong uh, multiple R squared there. Uh, and a, a very large, a very low, very small significance value. But of course it is difficult to tease all of these apart. You've got so many of the constituents of the milk. They're interacting, as you can see here, with a positive sign for one and a negative coefficient for the other. And uh, there's obviously issues around multiple testing. 
But at least there's an indication that there are positive associations within this hostile environment. HMOs vary by season. We need to ask questions as to how the mother's diet, how the external environment, the microbes that the mother and her breast is exposed to as well as the child. They vary by season in the Gambia. And we have this experiment of nature where that's what Gambia looks like if, as I came from on Tuesday uh, and in a couple of months' time. Sorry, in a couple of months' time, it would be transformed some, to something like that. That changes the food the mothers eat. It changes the um, uh, moisture in the environment, which changes the pathogen load and has enormous effects on disease prevalence and diet together. You can see that there are differences, even in these small sample numbers, between the season at which a baby was born and the total HMOs in the milk at 20 weeks. And unfortunately, we, that's difficult to tease apart because the season at which you're born correlates with the season at which you become 20 weeks. So you've got an inverse relationship at the 20 weeks. My surmise would be that it is the latter on the right-hand side that is really driving these changes rather than the season of the baby's birth. But I could be entirely wrong with that. As I've just indicated, that's going to always be difficult to tease out because you have this one-to-one -one correlation between the season you're born and the season you reach any further milestone. We've been able to show that there are differences in the HMO levels between sick and well children. So these children were studied very carefully. Uh, their mums were asked when they were sick or uh, well, and they were brought regularly into the clinic for the physicians to similarly check them. And you can see that there are relationships, significant relationships, in some of the HMOs between those sick and well children. You'll see that there's a reciprocity today, which we have hypothesized, is because the um, fucosyl transferase is more active, perhaps in response to the illness in the kids, and is transforming uh, more of the LNT towards its, uh, the, the precursor LNT towards the uh, possibly more functional HMOs. Is there a correlation between specific HMOs and microbiota? Now, David has uh, shown you an awful lot of data. Of course, this is an obvious question to ask, but what you end up with is something quite problematic. And I'm showing this to raise the difficulties associated with such analyses rather than to make big claims that there are strong correlations. There's clearly information hidden within here. There clearly will, in my mind, there clearly will be associations. Um, but the work that needs to be done in order to tease all these out is quite challenging. Next, I want to show you some work that uh, has been led by Shelley Maguire, and she's kindly lent me the material from these slides and allowed me to, produce, to present them to you. So the idea here was to be able to characterize what is normal, as in the title of our paper in AJCN last year. And to do that, we've sampled in exactly the same way milk from different environments, and we've analyzed it in exactly the same way. You can see that there are population differences in HMO levels uh, between all the women, the 40 women in each different site. The Gambia comes somewhere in the middle of these, so it's quite hard to tease out. You, you might, if we'd done this research two decades ago, we would have said, oh, all the developing country nations will have low levels and the uh, Western nations will have high levels. It doesn't seem that that is the case um, whatsoever. We can show very easily what you've already heard about earlier today, that there are differences in the HMO levels between secretors and non-secretors, and that those differences hold up across all of the populations studied, um, some with greater differences than others. If you look at the right-hand bar there, the California data, you'll see that there's an enormous difference between the secretors and the non-secretors. In our Gambian data, there's a smaller difference. Secretors dominate in all populations, and this is just the data from these different sites. Uh, as, and you can see that although they dominate in all populations, there is a difference in the degree to which they dominate. And in Peru and in California, which were Hispanic mums, uh, they're almost exclusively excretors. Now, what about differences in the breast milk microbiome? And here again, you can see very 
easily at first sight that there are differences. And if you've got acute eyesight, you'll be able to say, see that there are some uh, uh, significant differences between different populations. And for instance, this Ethiopian, the rural Ethiopian here, and I'll show you that again in a second, have large numbers of rhizobium, which are thought to be related to the diet that they consume. The composition in the Gambia comparing urban versus rural looks to be rather similar. Here's rural versus urban differences in the Gambia. And the take home from this, as I think you'll see at first sight, is that there are large variations between individuals. Incidentally, we're going to take this work forward and start to ask some of the longitudinal questions that David was also alluding to. But they're relatively similar overall. And that really contrasts with what happens in Ethiopia, where they, uh, there is also large variation between individuals, but you'll see also this large variation by location. So this tells us that the external environment, and my assumption here is that a lot of this is down to the maternal diet, can have enormous differences on the breast milk microbiome. Let's return to this and make the point that, again, we're really struggling to sort all of these out. Shelley has got a lot more data which will come into the, the public domain in a while, but just in relation to this question of the link between the milk microbiome and the gut microbiome, uh, she gave me information that she allowed me to show you, but I'm, I'm choosing not to because that will come out soon, and to... Uh, Made to, to condense it into this last of my data slides, uh, which compares the rural and urban Gambia and compares the top 10 genera in milk with the top 10 genera in infant feces. And you can see very clearly, and Shelley tells me, although I haven't seen them, but Shelley tells me that these graphs look very similar for the other settings. So we have a clear association here uh, between uh, the different cohorts, which themselves are tightly regulated, um, and the relationships, though similar, as I've just mentioned, uh, though, though rather significant, as I've just mentioned, in all of the cohorts, differ between the cohorts. So, what have we gained from all this? Once more, I stress that we've more to learn than we have learned to date. HMOs decline as lactation progresses. I expect you all knew that already. HMOs are influenced by genetics. If you didn't know it already, you've been told it twice today in previous presentations. There are large geographical variations in the HMOs. And I think what's really important about Shelley's new study is that it is using the same sampling procedures and the same analytical procedures. So we're now quite clear that there are large differences. HMOs correlate with infant wellness. That seems to be, uh, we're certainly developing the evidence to support that statement. There are questions about reverse causality here, and there are questions about the dynamic relationships, and David talked about this. Remember that the milk is not only there to nourish and to protect the baby, but the milk is also there to protect the breast itself, and in some of our old work, we found that to be very, very important in terms of the immune constituents of breast milk. There's large geographical variation in the breast milk microbiome and a rural urban divide in, Ga in Ethiopia, but not in Gambia. And finally, the breast milk microbiome correlates with the infant gut microbiome. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, but we still need the data to demonstrate that. So I leave you with the take-homes that still lots to do, but the evidence we've been able to accrue from this wonderfully breastfeeding population in the Gambia is that HMOs, not surprisingly, are massively important. And we look forward to the future research, which will help us to understand this in much greater detail. Thank you. Thank you very much.